He never tells me he can't play it. He never tells me he can't sing it. He just does it. And I appreciate that. Michelle, pull up that uh, hymn again. We, we talked about this hymn in our, in our life group a few weeks ago. We were talking about the atonement of Jesus Christ. And effectual atonement or effective atonement. Or, and uh, the ver and that when we were talking about that, this, this hymn came to my mind. And look at the, it's the third stanza, I think, Michelle. If thou hast my discharge procured, and freely in my room, in my place, endured the whole of wrath divine. And this is the, this is the phrase right here. You think about double jeopardy. God does not punish sin in Jesus and then punish it in the people for whom Jesus died. That would be double jeopardy to do that. Listen, payment God cannot twice demand. First at my bleeding surety's hand, that's Jesus. And then again at mine. It's almost powerful lines in all of hymnody. We need to think like that. We need to learn to think like that. For God to punish people in hell having punished those sins in Jesus would make him a monster to his own son, unjust to us. He doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. If we're saved by grace through faith here today, Jesus has endured God's wrath in our place, and we will never spend one second in hell receiving punishment for that. And that's a gospel you can preach, folks. That's a glorious gospel. Turn in your Bibles now to Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7. I'm going to read now the companion passage to what we read responsibly a while ago in Matthew 15. Mark chapter 7 verses 24 to 30. I hope you find this in your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible, see me after church and we'll get you one. We'll have it up on the screen. They have the text though so all can gaze upon the word. I never want you to take my word just as my word. I want you to see the scriptures for yourselves and see if these things are so. Mark chapter 7, verses 24 to 30. We're thinking about the amazing power of unwavering faith. I struggled earlier in the week to come up with a, what, what do we call this? A lot of unconditional faith, uh, undaunted faith, unwavering faith. Stand with me if you would. Follow along as I read this passage. And from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs." But she answered him, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. Thank you. Be seated. This is what we've just read here. The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. God help us to find the balance. There are people in Christian society today who press some of these things beyond what the Scripture will have them bear and would lead you believe to believe God doesn't ever want us sick. He wants us to have every, every material possession imaginable and that God's just sort of the goody man in the sky to give, 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 give. That's, a, that's an overstatement of a powerful biblical principle. But folks, we don't need to react to that overstatement by, by settling with an understatement. The challenge we have, I think, is to be on the biblical path, the evangelical path of truth. You see, James, in chapter 1, verse 6, says, But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea 
that is driven and tossed by the wind. We are, we are challenged in Scripture to ask in faith, period. In faith, believing, we might say. Yet I submit to you that our challenge is that we sometimes ask things in faith and then we doubt. Oh Lord, as best we understand your heart and your, your glory and your will, we pray that you will do this. But I don't know if he will. Ask in faith. Believing, not doubting. And then we're, we're, we're frail creatures of dust. I mean, I've told you through the years, I find myself often, it seems like back where the man who had the, had the boy that was afflicted and would throw himself into the fire, and, and the, Jesus looks at him and after the man describes the boy's position, and Jesus says, do you believe that I can do this? And he said, I, be I do believe, Lord, but even in saying that, I know there's a pocket of unbelief here. Help my unbelief. And we need to learn, as we grow in the Lord, to take him at his word. So I just want to share some passages with you that, that pr provoke us to ask in faith. And I want us to look at this Gentile woman and learn from her today. Matthew 7, verses 7 to 11, its companion is in, in Luke 11, 9 to 13. Jesus said in, in the original language, we read it in the English, ask and it will be given to you. There, these are present Verbs, present active verbs. Keep on asking and it will be given to you. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and it will be opened to you. For everyone who keeps on asking receives. The one who keeps on seeking finds. The one who continues to knock, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? If he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then who are evil... For some, that means totally depraved. For some of us, it means delivered from being totally depraved, but still battling remaining sin. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Do you think you want something better for your children than God does? No, we know we don't. Matthew 18, 19, Jesus says, Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. He's speaking there on, the, on how to practice redemptive discipline in a congregation. Matthew 21, 22, again, whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. John 14, 13. Jesus says, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. He said, there's, see, there's a bigger picture here, a bigger something happening in the, in the spiritual arena, in the heavenly sphere, when we ask and a reason to receive what we ask, that the, that the Father may be glorified in the Son, when we ask it in Jesus' name. John 15, 7 and 15, 16, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Now, now you get a little uh, parameter set here that, that the word of the Lord dwelling in us richly, the word of the Lord living in us, tabernacling in us, remaining in us, influencing our focus, influencing our thoughts, our motives, our desires. Ask whatever you wish, it will be done for you. And then verse 16 of chapter 15. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. In John 16, 23 and 24, in that day, this is Jesus still teaching, you will ask nothing of me. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive, that your joy may be full. So there's a lot of different, this, I'm not, this is not the message, this is just a little background text, but you see the path to joy is praying for the Father's will to be made known, praying for us to find peace and contentment in Christ, and out of that flows joy. Now, rather than moving through Mark verse by verse as we have done uh, to this point, I told you earlier I want to bring in the passage in Matthew 
and we're going to weave it together. I want you to take a look at this conversation that took place between Jesus, the Syrophoenician woman, the, the Gentile, the Canaanite woman, the non-Jew, that's the point. And then we're going to see how the disciples, the folks that represented us, responded in this. And I want to ask you, to, as you think about being a follower of Jesus Christ, to evaluate, would you, would you have been sounding the same alarm as the disciples? And I want to ask you more generally, if you had been the one seeking Jesus, at what point would you have given up pleading with him for help? You're going to see seven movements in this, in this uh, brief conversation. First, Jesus' inability to hide from the crowd. Second, a desperate mother pleads mercy for her daughter. Third, the first opportunity to quit, on her part to quit. Fourth, the second opportunity to quit. Fifth, the third opportunity to quit. Fourth, uh, sixth, the fourth opportunity to quit. And then finally, number seven, the amazing power of unwavering faith. Let's unpack this quickly. First of all, it struck me, Jesus' inability to hide from the crowd. Uh, both Mark and Matthew tell us that Jesus went away from where he was. Remember, he, he, had been, he had encountered the Pharisees who accused him, him and his followers, of not following the law, not washing their hands ceremonially. He, he rebukes them for their hypocrisy. Then he speaks to the whole crowd. He says, come here, I want to tell you something. And he says, it's not what goes into a person that defiles him, it's what comes out. He is teaching a message that I told you Peter would not get until Acts 10, and here is proof that Peter didn't get it when Jesus taught it. It's in this text. But what struck me about this, Mark says in verse 24, and he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. Now we know that Jesus could make himself invincible. Invisible, he did that at one point when he was speaking, teaching in the synagogue. They rushed upon him to grab him and throw him over a cliff, and as they were escorting him out to throw him over the cliff, he disappeared in their midst. But here is a different emphasis. The popularity, the noise, the, the talk about Jesus was so prevalent that he could not go into a community and go into a house without the word being spread around. And I, I asked myself this, could he hide in a wasso? Have we, as a part of the church, in Owasso, have we talked up Jesus so much that it would be impossible for him to come into this community and go to a house without a crowd showing up at the house? Boy. I think we need, to, we need to search our hearts and say, Lord God, that's probably not true now, but help me to undertake whatever I need to undertake so that I, would, that I would increase the likelihood that he could hide in a house in Owasso if he came. I was just struck by that. He could not, he didn't want to be known he was there, but he could not hide. It's the, it's, it's the secret, this messianic secret that you'll see over and over where he does a miracle. And he says, tell no one about it. It's the impossible thing. When you've been healed by Jesus, when you've been saved by Jesus, the one thing you cannot do is keep your mouth shut until religion sets in and somehow religion teaches us how to keep our mouth shut okay that's, that's not the message today but it just that struck me so the second thing we see in this in this movement is this this desperate mother pleads mercy for her daughter and we're told that immediately once it's known where he is and she hears about it she has this little daughter who has an unclean spirit and she's, uh, she's terribly perplexed by this spirit. This, Mark tells us uh, about this woman. Uh, a Gentile, Syrophoenician. Matthew tells us she's a Canaanite. The point there is she's not a Jew. You would have hoped that the disciples had heard what Jesus taught about. It's not what goes into a person that defiles him. It's what comes out of a person. So in other words, you can't call another person unclean simply because he's a Gentile and he's not a Jew. But they didn't hear it. So here she comes. Again, the force of the verbs are that she kept on crying. 
So this wasn't a one time, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. This, is, this reminds me very much of blind Bartimaeus who was sitting by the roadside and he heard that Jesus was moving that way. He's, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And of course, the folks who want to shut him up are who? The disciples. Well, here she is. This Gentile, this non-Jew, have mercy on me, O Lord. Son of David, my daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. Here's a desperate woman. Perhaps she has tried other means. Perhaps she's been told there is no hope for your daughter. And then perhaps she's heard there is someone in the community who casts out demons. And she addresses him with a language that's commendable. She says more about him than the Pharisees ever say about him. They call him Beelzebub. She calls him Lord. They call him a heretic and a blasphemer. She calls him son of David. In other words, you're the king. You're the, you're the coming Messiah king. And there she is. She's cast herself at the mercy of Jesus. Now, if you didn't know the Gospels, if you didn't know these four accounts, and if you didn't know that every time in the Gospels that someone cries out for mercy, Jesus stops and meets them with mercy, you would read through this passage somewhat perplexed because you see, when she begs for a mercy, Matthew tells us in the first opportunity she has to quit, he did not answer her a word. She's asking over and over, have, have mercy, Lord, son of David, have, have mercy. Oh, my daughter, have mercy. Not a word. And I wonder, would you have quit then? Well, I'm offended. I heard this fellow was compassionate for crying out loud. I mean, I've got a real concern here. He, he seemed completely unconcerned. He answered her not a word. He is silent. Now, it's fascinating because you see, the disciples misread the silence. Look at the second opportunity she had in Matthew 15, 23. And his disciples came and begged him. Now, she was begging him, have mercy on my daughter. Now, they begin to beg him. Lord, send her away. She's crying. She keeps on crying out after us. She, she is a nuisance. She is a disturbance. She is a distraction. She is, she is interrupting the ministry. Plus, there may have been some concern on their part that if Jesus was not going to answer her, that there might be some embarrassment that would come. And here's the miracle worker. The reputation he has is he, he, he can heal the sick. He can calm the seas. He can feed the multitudes miraculously. He's cast out demons before. And if he's not going to act on this woman's behalf, then in the disciples' mind, the sooner she is out of the way, out of sight, out of sound, then the sooner they can protect the reputation of Jesus because their reputation was tied to it as well. But folks, we need to be careful. Because if we're not careful, and the Lord brings across our path, brings into our midst folks who are, who are struggling, who, have, who, who are earnest and desperate that we will see them as a distraction as a disruption as an inconvenience would you have left would you have quit at that point when his followers who themselves had been sent out on mission and had come back and talked about the miraculous power that they experienced when his followers say send her away have nothing to do with this woman would you have quit the master hadn't said a word the people who speak for him are saying we don't need this would you have quit but then Jesus speaks this third opportunity she has to quit in Matthew 15, 24, and 25, he does finally speak. He answers her, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, he is saying what the prevailing 
Jewish mindset would be concerning Messiah. When he does speak, he basically says, woman, I don't help people like you. You're not of the house of Israel. You're not a Jew. You, you're not even a proselyte Jew. You haven't even gone through the, through the ch- transformation of coming out of the pagan Gentile world and going through Jewish training classes and become a, a Jew by being grafted in, a, a former Gentile. Would you have quit? I wasn't sent to help people like you. But she came and knelt before him continually saying, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. You see, folks, sometimes we quit too quickly. We, we give up too quickly. We, we don't get the answer we want immediately and, and everything in our society tells us we can have it our way and have it quickly and we don't, it, it, that doesn't fit the scriptural teachings. She misses her third opportunity to quit. And then the fourth opportunity presents itself. Mark 7, 27 records it as well as Matthew 15, 26. Jesus further answer. This is his response to her cry. Lord, help me. It's a softened answer from the previous, but it's not a very encouraging answer. He seems to open the door. Let the children be fed first. Now we know the principle here is that he came to the Jews and the Jews' rejection opened the door for the Gentiles. He always came for the Jews and the Gentiles. He always came for for true Israel, spiritual Israel. Let the children be fed first for it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Now are are you keeping track here? No answer. Disciples say, take her away, send her away. Jesus said, I didn't come to people like you. I'm nurturing the children, not their pets, not the dogs. Would you have quit? Someone said, did he just call you a dog? Well, I've, I've never. I'm offended. I'm going to go try to find the Anti-Defamation League and see if we can't get some legal action started against this fellow. He's clearly, he's clearly a racist bigot. Now you blend the two, Mark and Matthew say essentially the same thing. She doesn't quit. Mark 7, 28 and Matthew 15, 27, you pull together her answer. Yes, Lord. In other words, okay, I'm a dog. Okay, I don't, I don't, I don't reach, I don't reach children's status. Yet even the dogs under the table eat the crumbs of the children that fall from the master's table. Yes, Lord. I'm not asking to sit at the table. I'll take your crumbs. Four times she could have quit. And nobody could have blamed her. And in Jesus' omniscience, in his all-knowing, he draws her out. He demonstrates for all to see what perseverance and persistence in prayer looks like. It ignores the obstacles. It's deafened to the advice of the religious. It's undaunting. Therefore, it's unwavering. 
And when she has agreed with him about her condition, about her position, Jesus gives us a window into the amazing power of unwavering faith. And when you blend Matthew 15, 28 and Mark 7, 29, here's what you get. Oh, woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. For this statement, you may go your way. The demon has left your daughter. Now I submit to you that it took faith for her to walk away. It took faith for her to leave, take Jesus at his word, and go back to the house. And Mark tells us, Matthew tells us, and Mark tells us, her daughter was healed instantly. When she went home, she found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. There is amazing power in unwavering faith. It's not a if then or a plug in the formula and you can get everything you want. It's not a notion that says, well, I think I'll, just, I'll ask the Lord for a Ferrari then. If, you, if you're thinking that way, you're missing this. But you know something? If you need, if you need wheels to travel, and you plead with the Lord to give you something to travel, it's in his prerogative to give you a Ferrari if that's how he wants you to drive. You see, there's a difference here. Trusting the Lord to meet you at your deepest need. There are times, and it gets, it gets focused for this woman, it's focused on her daughter's condition. But I want you to know that it was her desperation of her daughter's condition that gave the occasion for her eyes to be opened to Jesus. I think she went to him as a healer who could cast out demons. And I think she left him seeing him in a very majestic way. I would say a gospel way. Oftentimes, life does that for us. We find ourselves in circumstances, find a loved one in circumstances. It breaks our hearts. We, we want to help. We want to fix it. We want to see healing. We want to see recovery. And, and we can't. And the normal means that are used around us don't seem to be effectual. And we can determine, well, you know, the Lord uses means, and if he hasn't used the doctors to heal this person, if he... I think doctors had told this woman, this woman she didn't have any hope. And I think Jesus shows the disciples how terribly wrong they are about non-Jews. Just another lesson. And I think he shows them the power of persevering in prayer. See, I'm talking to some of you today who have done that in your lives. You have known what this passage means. And I'm also speaking to some of us who have given up too soon. Who concluded that the, the absence of God's immediate answer means that God has said no, that his silence means no. And you would have thought this earlier on in this passage. You would have thought when he did not speak a word that basically without saying anything, his answer to her was no. In fact, when he spoke, you would have thought his answer to her was no. And when he spoke again, you would have thought his answer was no. Until she continues to plead, she continues to place herself at Jesus' feet, begging for mercy, begging for help, acknowledging she doesn't deserve it. And yet appealing to him not on the basis of what she imagines she deserves, but appealing to him on the basis of who he is. Not, not a this for that, but a mercy, a move of mercy. You see, everywhere in the New Testament that someone begged Jesus for mercy, he met them and answered their request and, and showed them mercy, except the one time when he told the story about the man who died and from hell begged for mercy, and it was too late. So, we need, I include myself in this, we need 
to be people persistent and persevering in prayer. Not because we can somehow change God's mind by doing that, but because you see as you, pers you persist and persevere in prayer, you will make your, put yourself in a position where you're keenly aware of his will in the answer. And if you're persistent and persevering in prayer, you will never come out on the other end of it bitter. She could have walked away at any point and been a bitter woman. And somebody could have said, well, have you heard about Jesus? I said, don't talk to me about Jesus. You know people like that. Don't talk to me about Jesus. Don't talk to me about church. Yeah, they may have been hurt, but there was an absence of persistence and perseverance. And this lady, one of our forebears, a Gentile like us, showed us the value of pursuing and pressing upon Jesus to do that which only he can do. Oh, brothers and sisters, if we live life and do ministry within the comfortable bounds of doing what we know we can do, and we don't put ourselves in a position where if Jesus doesn't move, there'll be no movement, if Jesus doesn't come, there'll be no answer. If Jesus doesn't act, there'll be no victory. You see, if we don't put ourselves there, we miss the amazing power. Jesus commends this woman. He will say to his disciples on different occasions, Oh, you of little faith, did you not believe? But to this woman, not a Jew, Oh, woman, great is your faith. For this statement, you may go your way. Be it done for you as you desire. The demon has left your daughter. And she would have missed that had she taken any one of the four opportunities to quit. What about you? What about me? We're going to quit? You see, the, the very next press upon the mercy of the Lord may be the one where he answers. What about those of you here who are unconverted? Perhaps you've said, well, I, Pastor, I've asked the Lord to save me before. My parents taught me what I need to do, and I've done that. And I, I didn't, he didn't save me. I so I'll fool you on it then. Oh, friend, how do you know? But that the next time you press will be the time the Lord says, you're mine. I'm yours. Come, my child. Blessed are you. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. How do you know but that the next time you press will be the answer? But you won't know when Hopeful tells his story in Pilgrim's Progress to Christian about how he came to walk in the way that he now walked. And it's how he came to be a Christian. He, read it sometimes. I've referenced it several times. The years. Read it. He talks about the agony he went through and and how he would seek the Lord and over and over and over. And, and, and Christian said, well, did you ever think about quitting? And he said, oh, 200 times or more I thought about quitting. But I reasoned with myself this way, that if I quit now, I will simply die at the throne pleading for mercy that I have not received. But if I continue, and I did continue, he said, and one day I heard the Lord say to me, my grace is sufficient for you. What would we be <laughs> as a congregation of people who took Jesus at his word and learned this lesson and said, we will, by God's grace, prevail in prayer. 
What victories will we be talking about today? What will we be celebrating today? How awestruck would we be and the people around us be as they see the hand of God answering prayer? We will not know if we quit. But my prayer is for myself, beginning with myself, that we cultivate in us this, this grace of persisting in and persevering in prayer. Believing that no matter what may come to us initially, that ultimately our God, our Savior, will manifest mercy. He delights in giving mercy to those who beg for mercy. Let's pray.